Reden. Раз, два, три, раз, два, три, раз, два, три. One, two,
1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Так, это я понял. Раз, два, три, раз, два, три. Раз, два, три, раз, два, три. Раз, два, три, четыре, пять. Раз, два, три. Раз, два, три, тест. Раз, два, три, тест. Раз, два, три, тест. Один, два, три, тест. Раз, два, три, один, два, три, тест. Раз, два, три, раз, два, три. Раз, два, три, четыре. Раз, два, три. Раз, два, три, четыре, пять. Тест. Один, два, три, четыре. Тест. Раз, два, три. Тест. Раз, два, три. Тест. Раз, два, три. Тест. Раз, два, три. Тест. Тест. Раз. На одного туриста посудочно 150 рублей за штуку.
значит, выделяешь в первом столбике любую ячейку. В верхнем, в верхнем левом углу есть такая кнопочка на метелку похожая. В верхнем левом углу, да. Нажимаешь на нее. Вот, она выделяется там пунктиром, эта ячейка, а потом ты мышкой тыкаешь на, прямо на столбик, где написано столбик 2 или 3. На него тыкаешь, и он, да, и он становится нормально. Давай. Что-то мы настроили, опять такая шляпа получается. Вот только было нормально. Вот у нас здесь надо было. Было, да, нет, вот видишь, короче. Мы же с ним тестили еще раз, он говорит, сначала нет, потом я подождал. Да, все
that is a big advantage. So if we make uh, appropriate policies and, and make it possible for the people to embrace the new technology so everybody can benefit and obviously there has to be that specific intervention uh, reaching out to those societies. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you know, I want to I want to go to you next, Milas, if, if, if you don't if you don't mind. I think um, um, it'd be great for everyone to know for, first if you can describe a bit about e Estonia, right? Um, um, and and because uh, in some ways Estonia, I think, is is ahead of ahead of so many parts in terms of making this 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 jump into a digital world. Um, and I wonder if you can talk about uh, um, one, tell us what that looks like, but then also tell us the, sort of what 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 what's been been learned so far, or, you know, um, what, we, what we know. And, and, and I guess I, I'll, I'll be preface with one other point, which is when I say that Estonia is so much ahead, you know, we often think of ahead and progress. We imagine flying cars and, and everything stu super shiny. So, so uh, um, but I think Estonia has done this in a, in a much more foundational skills kind of, you know, to use that foundational notion way. Uh, so I, I'll, let you, I'll let you describe it. Thank you. It's uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, to be here and, and and share some of the ideas. Yes. First of all, I, I think it's uh, very very important for all of us to realize that that of course uh, in one way and the world is changing and and everything is right. What we have said that uh, that uh, all the skills are new and and the people are new and everything is unexpected. But I don't think any societies in large want to hear that. <laughs> Societies in large want to get a um, step-by-step plan because then they want to know, okay, if you say that the job in 10 years is gone, then they want to say, okay, then what's the solution? So if we say that nobody knows, it's, it's not really, at least not from the educational minister's part, that you can say, you know, we keep educating you, but we have no idea what we do in 10 years. So that's not really a good plan. So what we, what we can do and what we have, uh, we have seen is that first thing is what uh, um, the dear panelists already said, is that uh, foundational skill, meaning that we still need to educate people. We need to still uh, give them all a basic um, knowledge. Um, if we look at them, most of the areas which have developed the fastest have the foundational also research we need to have still fundamental research. It's not that we replace everything with IT. It's the IT comes as one of the tools. So this is, I think, something very, very important. Also in our education system, for example, in Estonia, we start out of kindergartens and primary schools. But it's not on instead of something, but it's additional of something. It gives you, we have a digital textbooks in additional to the paper ones. So we still start, for example, in a primary level, in a very basic ones, but then every uh, teacher knows that there is in a tool cupboard there's some amazing things, for example, to do in a chemistry or, or physics or give you robotic skills to understand why math is cool. And what we have achieved with that, for example, is in IT sector, we have one of the highest share in girls because the girls have actually realized that robotics and math can be understandable, can be fun, and can be something what you can do. It's not, there is no gender, basically, division anymore. Vice versa, we have now a tendency to have more girls going there. LTT, every 10th person goes to Deo to LTT. It's one of the highest in the world. Also, the reason is we start early and say it's, it's not only easy and math, of course we still have kids who find math very scary, but that more depends on the teacher rather than uh, than the whole system. So what do we what It's just a digital literacy. That's what we call it. Mm -hmm. To give you and and what is our aim is that we we want to have a new generation not to be any more users but to be creators in the first place. Mm -hmm. So this is what is the basic thing. How in a world, they will choose to use it. That depends. I mean, you can become a normal, um, just, uh, I don't know, you are uh, just a smart father or a mother, and, and, and you just uh, teach your kids, uh, just, for example, the digital hygiene. What does it mean? How it serves? And, and maybe in the first place, you don't even use your IT skills, but then at the end of the day, you may be becoming creating something. Or it can be that you go to the vocation training. In the beginning, it seems that you're going on a very traditional path. But as you have the tools already, 
digital tools. And then you go and maybe uh, upgrade your job. You make it more efficient. You, you share this knowledge and you get the spillover effect. Mm. So what, what we have seen in Estonia is that the generation to come, uh, the spillover effect is that the newer people come, they make it more efficient and then it it's, more, it's never been a governmental policy forcing people to do something, but more like, for example, we started out of the having infrastructure. It's very important. We still nowadays uh, a little bit make ourselves to believe that, um, that uh, Wi-Fi or mobile replaces. It's a great possibility. But still, for example, as I'm a minister, government responsibility is still stays to build infrastructure. Yeah. And nowadays, it's a fiber connection. Everybody wants to have a higher speed connection. It, so the, the mobile is fantastic, but at least from educational purposes, we need to have the infrastructure. We need to have them a computer networks. We need to have them uh, all of that. Otherwise, you can, in the research facilities, now we're talk, talking about meta computers, uh, mm -hmm. mega uh, possibilities. So this is all what we need to create in addition to that. What do you achieve? Efficiency. We start saving the paper, we will have a lot of things in the e-format, we share the knowledge very fast from each other, uh, you can make uh, mega data or you have big data, you can uh, join information from uh, social structures, from medical structures, from e-governments, from... Uh, and what in Estonia it means that your, your social uh, information, your medical information, everybody has e-digital uh, medical file, your taxes, your economic background, your military background, your academic background, everything is in a big files and we are working with the limits of a personal data use that we can, we can actually start creating, kind of predicting you already a services and that the service can share uh, the information and you can already start giving people better and better services. Um, if, if you ask what in Estonia it means, for example, one of the examples we give everyone, sorry for boring youth for that, is that Estonian general public files taxes in one minute. Uh, it, in many countries it takes a lot of accountants to work, <laughs> in Estonia it takes one minute. Everything is pre-formed and you just go through it. Uh, if you go to the doctor, most of the, all your background is already there. It doesn't matter where, what hospitals you take a screening or you need help, your information flows together. Um, so, et cetera, et cetera. So, where the idea is efficiency. You can take the services in different parts and, and, and we try to help you as efficient as possible. So, I, you know, from, from a standpoint of, of citizen, of consumer, of, of, of this, this sounds great, you know, I can, I can do my taxes so, so quickly, I, 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 can, I, can do all, I can show up at the doctor, everything's ready, of course, from the standpoint of the accountant and the standpoint of the people who do the, 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 the medical administration, this is, this is, this re, this is a, a, a job that's gone. So, so, so how does this, I mean, that must require a, a, a skills question. These are people who really prepared their whole lives, these specific skills. And while I certainly see the benefits, you know, what, what do we do as a, as a, as a society, an international society and, and an Estonian society with, with, with that? Like, what's the trade-off for efficiency? What are you discovering and how do you prepare people for that? The beginning is difficult. <laughs> I, um, let's start up. I mean, it's difficult to... Um, the picture is a beautiful, of course, but uh, let's start out of uh, if you start in any country, let's say the um, uh, e-medicine or me recipe. It's in the beginning, if you go, let's say about one and a half year, you got, went to the doctor, a doctor was sitting in front of a computer and typing. Yeah. So <laughs> the, the back area was that uh, especially elderly people felt extremely uh, unsure because uh, it used to be that doctor was communicating with you. Now the computer was in front of the eyes and then the doctor was turning. It took about, I would say about 18 to 24 months. Mm -hmm. And then all the data was already inserted and of course, then nowadays it's it's different. But in the beginning, yes, there was a lot of um, kind of questions. The same with uh, with e-schooling. Now every single data that happens at school is in a computer. Me as a parent, I love it because uh, in let's say 10 seconds after the lesson is over, I know what happened with my kid in a class. 
I know the grades, I know what the subject they covered, I know if there was a problem or if he or she didn't show up in a lesson. I can send SMS and ask, oh, where did you go? Okay, you went to the shop and didn't show up. Okay, so there is, there is a lot of possibilities like that. There is a very direct communication. Again, it took about uh, half a year because the teachers first were like, what on earth? After all the things I need to do, now I need to sit in front of the computer and start typing something. But once the data was in, once the flow was in, then teachers also realized that we replaced a lot of things what they did before. Mm -hmm. So what is important for the, for the whole system to adapt also very fast, because if you need to do everything on a paper and then additional to the computer, of course it doesn't work. Yeah. But you need, then you need to exchange and, and, and you need to reform. So nowadays we don't do a lot of paper things anymore and now it's more efficient and now teachers see the benefit. But it took about half a year, year. Yeah. I want to go, I want to, I want to, you, you said, you talked about the idea of, uh, of starting with fundamental or foundational skills and, and moving towards creating digital creators. Right, uh, this idea that this idea that, that you really needed to educate kids to to be able to use those tools to 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 be creative and and to, and to see themselves as as creators. And I want to take that idea and 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 go to Max because uh, Max has done a, done a lot of work in, in building things. So maybe you can you can respond to that idea. Yes, uh, I think uh, it's very important because um, when we talk about kids. Uh, we need to do something to prepare them to the future. But uh, we don't know about the future, we don't know about jobs, uh, we don't know about technologies. Because uh, now, uh, every year, we have uh, uh, 100 new technologies. And uh, it's uh, 100 times faster uh, than 100 years ago. Uh, that's why we need some uh, basics uh, basic uh, digital skills uh, for our kids uh, because now you can create a new product uh, from scratch. Uh, we have uh, a lot of infrastructures like App Store or Google Play. You can create a new digital product uh, in one month or one week. Uh, and uh, everything what you need, you need to understand uh, how you can create something in the digital world because uh, all of um, our mm, new projects and new businesses they are already in digital. Uh, our parent company, uh, Redmet Robot, it's uh, first mobile development company in Russia and we have uh, a lot of uh, projects for big names and it's um, Every project, it's a teamwork, and uh, it's not only about uh, programmers. Um, it's about designers, managers, uh, product managers, analytics, and so on. And all of them need uh, these basics of digital. That's why uh, we, uh, when we're um, thinking about uh, some products for kids, uh, we use these basic digital skill sets uh, from our main business and uh, create a kids digital skill set. Can you tell us what they are? What, what is a kids, like? <laughs> kids digital skill set. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> what are the... What
новый продукт. И данный процесс вполне работает. Не знаю еще, на самом деле, что касается данных детей. Возможно, они... У них есть желание создать какой-то цифровой продукт, или, возможно, они хотят преследовать медицинское направление. В будущем, так или иначе, данные базовые компетенции им нужны. То есть, в каком-то смысле вы говорите о возможностях использования данных фундаментальных навыков, будь то в отношении людей или цифрового мира. И, собственно, вы хотите их использовать так для, для того, чтобы они нравились детям, и чтобы дети могли их использовать. Что, опять же, не да, я знаю, например, своих детей, с ними нужно на каком-то вот... На своем языке разговаривать, когда ты говоришь, что тебе нужно выучить математику для того, чтобы бухгалтером, им это не интересно, но когда ты говоришь, что да, вот нужно выучить данную математическую форму для того, чтобы выиграть в данной игре, это работает. Но когда тебе 7 лет, рано еще думать о карьере, не так ли, о будущей профессии, когда вы маленький ребенок, на самом деле вы об этом не думаете. На самом деле сложно даже моих детей заставить думать о мороженом, пока машина не залезет. Собственно, ваш вот этот подход, основанный на играх, замечателен. И это, опять же, немного отражает то, что вы, Кайла, нам рассказали про активное обучение. Говоря о будущих профессиях, и когда мы не знаем, что нас ожидает в будущем, у меня она... на самом деле... Есть следующий момент. Я проводила обучение э, профессиональным компетенциям давно, 14 лет где-то. После этого потом я ушла, потом стала, перешла в технологии, стала говорить о кодировании, о работе с интерфейсами. Также визуальный язык я много изучала, потому что для, сейчас, чтобы создать пользовательские интерфейсы, нужно использовать иконки, типографию, формы и цветы. Но теперь, в данный момент, появилась новая возможность. Есть Siri, Alexa, Shadbots и... С помощью данных инструментов, как мы знаем, больше визуальный язык не требуется. Требуется текст, эмоджи, тон, э, голос. И вот так оно и работает. Сейчас нет таких работ, на которых требуются эти компетенции, но, возможно, в будущем это так и будет. Потому что в прошлом мы могли предсказывать все, но... Например, я знаю, что я буду делать в будущем, и я должна к этому или должен к этому подготовиться. Но сейчас все очень быстро меняется, и необходимо действительно менять все на ходу, потому что мне нужно понимать, что происходит с пользовательским интерфейсом. Например, вот сегодня мы видели здесь дрон. Если мне, если мне нужно создавать пользовательский интерфейс для таких дронов, тогда мне нужно подумать, какие навыки мне нужны, чтобы и нужно их приобрести. Ну, крайне важно, конечно, иметь фундамент для этого. Нужно понимать, какие компетенции мне нужны будут в будущем, чтобы ответить на этот вызов. Да, это абсолютно правильно. Я здесь хотел бы вернуться к этому примеру этих фигур и цветов, и эмоджи. Сейчас все об этом говорят, и все говорят об этих фундаментальных навыках, которые находятся даже за пределами цифровых технологий. Потому что для того, чтобы создавать пользовательский интерфейс, необходимо также знать основы геометрии. Если мы говорим о чат-ботах и каких-то интерфейсах, здесь нам также нужно подумать о, ком о коммуникациях, но это не цифровые навыки, а это общие навыки. Поэтому мы можем сказать, что цифровые навыки о том, чтобы использовать основополагающие фундаментальные навыки в цифровой рамке. И я думаю, что мы слышали много таких примеров, потому что сейчас в мире все очень паникуют по поводу На каком-то уровне мы можем действительно очень хорошо понимать, какие навыки нужны. И я, например, смотрю сейчас на экран и... достаточным количеством навыков в области ИКТ. И здесь, конечно, мы говорим также о цифровом разрыве. Мы все время говорим о том, что людям нужно, 
это, конечно, все правильно, но как начать работать над, в этом направлении для того, чтобы действительно у нас было равенство? цифровое равенство по всему миру, потому что мы также много говорим о, о женщинах в сфере IT. Не могли бы вы прокомментировать это? Да, у нас есть такой стереотип, что математика не для девушек, не для женщин, компьютеры тоже не для женщин. Но если мы подумаем просто о детях, в общем, компьютеры и игры — это больше для мальчиков. И я думаю, что это вот эта первая проблема, с которой мы сталкиваемся, потому что у нас неправильное восприятие этой ситуации. И еще одна проблема — женщины в IT, у нас просто есть большой разрыв. И почему это? Потому что мы стремимся к социализации в... и перфекционизму в этом. У нас есть такие стереотипы, и мы видим, что женщины пытаются делать все, наиб... чтобы все было идеально. И если мы подумаем о, например, программировании, тогда там не может быть все идеально. И я думаю, что не очень сложно обучить программированию. Необходимо практиковаться в этом, повторять и повторять. Но это просто вопрос усидчивости и времени. Но есть женщины, которые также хотят развиваться в области технологий, И они также начинают посещать курсы по программированию. И мы говорим им, хорошо, вот у вас есть такая программа, 30 минут нужно программировать. И в какой-то момент девушка или женщина смотрит на экран и говорит, я не понимаю, как мне сейчас нужно программировать. И тогда... Если, например, преподаватель подумает, что у женщины было там 20-30 минут, и она ничего не сделала, но это неправильный подход. Необходимо понимать, что женщина могла попробовать, попытаться сделать что-то. Но да, хорошо, ей это не удалось, но она все-таки попыталась. Необходимо это принимать во внимание. Нам необходимо создавать такую экосистему, чтобы женщины понимали, что делать ошибки — это нормально. Необходимо пытаться и снова пытаться. Возможно... So, 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 so in some ways, uh, just to broaden this, you know, you, you, you spoke uh, you, about the, um, the way, uh, you know, uh, how, how women may have more of a fear of failure, for, exa for, yes. for example, where yes. it's, it's not about the difficulty of the, uh, of, of, of the technical skill as yes. much as, as the, the, the psychological differences and that the awareness that a teacher has yes. about thinking about those, those coming in actually makes, makes a huge difference. It's not uh, a question of ability, it's a question of how boy and girl face a challenge. Yeah. And again, then, uh, again, how fundamental things impact the, di yes, the digital skills. Sure. Uh, uh, Max, you, 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 spoke, uh, you spoke already about making, uh, uh, about making this skills training, um, uh, uh, digital skills training and, and coding engaging. How do you make it accessible uh, so that we don't end up with, with digital divide, whether that's a gender gap, whether, that, that, whether that's a socioeconomic gap, whether, I mean, I could name a lot of gaps, so I won't, won't go through the whole list. Yeah, it's a lot of gaps here. Uh, one of them uh, about teachers, because um, it's very interesting. But in our uh, program in Codewords, it's about uh, 15, 50 uh, percent uh, of teachers are not ICT teachers. They are um, elementary teachers uh, in elementary school, uh, teachers of mathematics. Uh, or language, uh, and it's not a problem if you have uh, a proper form uh, for teachers too, because uh, on one hand you have a proper form for kids, it's a game, but you need um, a proper form for teachers too. And it's very amazing, uh, then um, if you have uh, this uh, game-based product, uh, the teachers uh, learning uh, from these game-based mechanics too. That's why uh, we can uh, use uh, these products from um, zero level of teachers. And it's, it's not a problem, but you need uh, some 
games and uh, some scenarios for uh, teachers. And uh, you need, well, it's like an um, augmented teacher. <laughs> you need some uh, ICT systems. It's like uh, in medicine, uh, mm -hmm. in uh, speech uh, uh, from, uh, uh, we talk about uh, medicine and uh, doctors who have uh, right. monitors and a lot of data to have right decisions. Yeah. Uh, it's the same. If you have an uh, IT system uh, who helps teacher have uh, create proper decisions, it's, it's good for him and uh, it's good for zero level. Yeah. You need these two points, augmentation yeah. and uh, game form. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, 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 so uh, uh, on the one hand, making making sure the, the the professional development to make sure the teachers are equipped to yes. to do to yes. do it. But also, exactly. I think you're emphasizing uh, as a as a teacher myself uh, something that, that that's very very clear, which is that you tend to sort of instinctively or unconsciously try to t teach the way that you were learn the, the way that you learn. So we need to if we really want to think about that teacher development, it's also a, a sort of shift to the pedagogical structure of professional yes. development. It's because in some ways, most of what we do is just sort of imitating those who showed us what to do. Absolutely. Uh, so I like this idea that you need to make sure that the, that the, the approach that the teachers would use to teach the kids must be the same approach that you use to teach the teachers how to teach the kids. It's yes. It's a lot, uh, a lot of words. Uh, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> let's, let's go. Srinivas, can, can you talk to us a bit? I want to, I wanna, again, staying on this theme of, of access and digital divide and, 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 and equity, tell us, tell us a bit about how how the ILO thinks about this question and, and overcoming what is, what is clearly a, a digital divide. Is, is it widening right now or is it, or is it shrinking? <laughs> well, I think it's important to, you know, basically reinforcing what colleagues have uh, uh, stated is to promote access uh, to new technologies in all parts of the society. It's fundamental and very critical. While certain technologies in any case will be um, expanding, but from an education and, and learning perspective, how do we enable people uh, by accessing new technologies? It is not exaggeration to say that still in many parts of the world, people uh, understand computer through a, you know, a kind of a graphic mm -hmm. and have no real access to the actual computer. So promoting access uh, to these new technologies by all the people, is the first and foremost thing. And then looking at the le learning preferences, for example, learning preferences are changing. Uh, mm. In many parts of the world, people are no longer glued to, you know, reading everything in a textbook, but, um, you know, you have the handheld devices and mobile phones and all kinds of things. So how can we make it easier? For people at all ages, investing in teachers' education is so important. If, if, if they have to kind of include digital education, First of all, we need to pay attention to how do we empower the teachers to be able to acquire that knowledge and skill first before they transmit. So teacher as an adult in the society is one angle, but all adults, people have to change jobs because transitions are occurring. Earlier, a driver was very good if that person knows how to drive the vehicle very well. But today, the job content of a driver has changed. Person has to understand how a mobile, system works, how GPS works, how mobile money works, so there is digital uh, aspects into even core jobs. So, so is the case with an electrician or a plumber, so every job is undergoing a change in terms of inducing digitalization. So which means people at all ages, it's not, so the learning is not just about initial education for young people. It is learning digital education and training for all ages of people, including older workers. In certain parts of the world, we have aging society that need to continue to do the jobs. And do, are we creating enough conditions for them to acquire the digital skills? Mm. And the last, no, the important notion is, it's very important now for uh, inculcating the learning to learn. This morning we heard, um, you know, after completing the plus two or whatever education, immediately after completion, completing the examinations, people are fed up and, you know, they don't want <laughs> to further learn anymore. But on the other hand, paradoxically, we are um, advocating for a lifelong learning uh, because of the disruption. So therefore, it is important to invest in the learning to learning 
kind of skill to be acquired from early on and inculcate that thinking uh, through all ages of life. So it's very important for us to be able to um, enable people to have these transitions, be it school to work or work to work and even in older ages, how do we enable people to use the new technologies, digital technologies to continue to be employed, to continue to gain access to the labor market, not only to retain but also transition. I think that's important and, and all parts of the world, how do we enable access to technologies and, and empower teachers and other uh, parts of the system. Milas, t tell us a bit, I mean, we've done this very, in, 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 so, so far this question of, of access and, and equity in a, in a very um, uh, ab abstract uh, theoretical way. So, so what, what has that looked like in Estonia where, where everyone kind of had no choice but to become, become a, 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 a digitally, um, a digi I don't want to say a digital citizen because they're, they're, you know, they're, they're normal citizens, but, but, but they, they access the, those, the, the, and they enact citizenship through digital means. Um, and that must have, have, have had some, maybe, maybe not surprising, but, but certainly large uh, um, 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 issues when it came to questions of, of equity and, uh, and, and access. I mean, I'm sure there were some people who had never seen a phone. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, uh, so if we continue from that um, and see the digital divide, I mean, one, one thing is, is, of course, clear Estonia is very small and relatively compact. So the divides are not uh, huge, but there is also generation cap. So what we are having as a challenge is, of course, having a lot of services in electronic format today, well, basically almost all the services. Um, so if I'm not mistaken of the statistics, it was, I think, something like uh, 9,000 different services are today online. Um, so what humans are every now and then need, some more, some less. And, uh, and a lot of these services are tailored actually to the people with the special needs of people who are elderly. And of course, they might not have a digital skill. So what are the services we can uh, and how we give them access? So the idea of a digital form is that it's access to everybody. It's fast, it's efficient, so on. So one thing is, of course, uh, just to have elderly people. Now, we have uh, tons of programs where uh, actually it's called grand grandparents. Um, so basically, it's uh, kids teaching the elderly generation. And especially in the remote areas, it's hugely popular. Uh, elderly people feel that they empower it because they get out of a uh, house and they need to dress well, they, they, they need to walk or, or, or come together, that's a social, and then they have uh, kind of a younger, younger generation giving them um, something. So, um, and this basically just getting over this uh, skin is what you explained about uh, um, uh, women very often, the same with elderly people. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, but the, the biggest thing there is to explain them why. You cannot, uh, you, I, I think the motivation comes from kindergartens, comes from primary schools, but it comes also for elderly. It's very, very bad motivation if a motivation is necessity, that otherwise you don't get access. Or, or for example, you lose a job if you don't do it. I, I think, or like you said, the kids to getting into a car. Do you motivate that if you don't get a uh, car, then you never get ice cream, or you motivate that if you get really fast, then you get better ice cream? <laughs> so I think that with a society, it's the same. It depends how we're looking at that. So what we do is digital is not purpose on its own. Digital is doing something, and on a way we need to realize how to motivate people to come along. We don't replace something unless we have created the tools to having cross the digital divide. Sometimes, okay, it's not never 100%. Maybe 1% stays somewhere, or we have not thought about certain person who is paralyzed, and then we need to have an uh, assistant who helps. But in general, if we, de if we create, because of, of course the creators themselves come from a private sector like Max or, or, or Carla or somebody else, that they, they have a problem they want to solve it. But very often, we as a public um, make attenders Okay, we're not very often clear what to ask. And then sometimes the private sector on the way comes along and says, you know, the tender wasn't very good, let's do it more efficiently. But we still make a first choice. And when we make a choice, we need to think about the side effects. 
do we retrain, how we involve the PA sectors, and again, I come back to the very first, we need to see whether we have infrastructure. What uh, nowadays we do, for example, we, we really want to have so-called last mile. We want to have physical infrastructure for that. We need to have mobile coverage everywhere. And what do it creates in addition to that is not only the people are not left assigned, but you create new possibilities. People can uh, work from home, people can have flexible hours. We get more females into the job because they, they stay at home with kids, and at the same time they work because, as we know, kids sometimes sleep, sometimes very long hours, or sometimes they don't, but very often they sleep. Then you can work, you can, you can adjust the things, or for example, uh, we have had a problem of empowering certain groups. For example, if you have a uh, uh, people, you need to take care of somebody, you need to stay at home. We have big percentage of societies who take care of elderly or, 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 or special uh, people. So if you create this internet access and all of that and give them different tools, then the people who are sometimes very good specialists, high educated specialists, they can actually do something in addition to that. So this is uh, cr um, creating different possibilities of the sectors which used to be left aside of a, of a society. So in a, in a, it's, it's strange, but digital also involves the ones who might have been not. Or for example, uh, we very often talk about the young people who are uh, not socially involved because they have um, special characteristics or they are socially left aside. And then what normally identified youth worker would say, stays at home and sits in front of a computer. Mm -hmm. So if we can actually access them and give them something in addition to or aside of what they do in front of the computer, there, and then we actually involve another sector of society, young people who do not socially having the skills and then actually are becoming a part through their loose network. They maybe never come to the computer um, facilities and create, but they, if they get access to, for example, coding, and then it's become a creators together with some other network creators, we actually get them socially involved as well. So that's what I'm trying to say. It's, it gives also tools. We need to just realize them and, and give them a possibility. Yeah. Well, I, I, I want to open it up to all of you. Does anyone have questions you'd like to ask our fantastic panel? Right here, let's start here. Um, they'll bring you here. Yeah, hi, thank you, Jordan. Uh, hello. And thanks everyone for a very exciting uh, conversation. My name is Javad Khan and I um, uh, represent, I head the largest skills development fund in Pakistan. A uh, question to Shrivas uh, from the ILO platform is, you know, your home country, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, you know, the, the South Asian countries, huge, huge populations, you know, Pakistan is 210 million people. 60% of the population is below the ages of 30. And, uh, you know, 36% of, of that youth population actually has education levels of either high school or below. So in Pakistan, we have about 60 million uh, young people who have very low education attainment levels. The question is, and that's the current, so I want to talk a little bit about the current, this is the current workforce. These are people that are either in or very soon joining uh, the, uh, the job, the workforce. How do we, with people that have such um, low level of education, you know, what is the best way to teach them in, in scale, digital literacy, and have you seen any programs anywhere which have dealt with this segment of the youth population where they've been able to teach them digital literacy and it has actually worked? Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that question. Thank you very much uh, for raising this very important question and this is uh, both in terms of the access and also the scale and the importance of really reaching out to those uh, uh, those people. And, and so the, you mentioned the numbers. So these are, um, in, in theoretical terms, are demographic, demographic dividend to the country. If properly they are skilled and, and they are put into the uh, economic uh, activity. I think what the digital revolution offers an opportunity 
to really skill these uh, people by using new technologies, be it a variety of new technologies, including augmented reality or virtual reality. We are seeing in bits and pieces in certain uh, skills programs where people are used to deploy those skills, the, those technologies to be able to reach large numbers of people, but in a way that people prefer those choices. Recently, I was attending a group of private sector companies that uh, have um, developed a, a management development program. Uh, almost entirely, 90% of it is uh, modular video-based program, where a, a module is not more than three minutes, and about 60 modules for the managers to learn these techniques wherever and whenever at their will and pleasure, for example, they're waiting in an airport, they complete one module. They're eating somewhere, complete another module. They don't have to go to a school, they don't have to go to anybody, they don't have to talk to anybody. If, if uh, that technology is now available for all people and everywhere. So if we can use these technologies to enable uh, these people, young people in, in developing world, to learn based on their own will and pleasure, at their convenience, without having to pull everybody to an institution, then that becomes a challenge in terms of really, institution becomes a liability. Once you create a program, we cannot get rid of the program. But making it dynamic enough that shoots to the needs of the labor market, and but that also takes into the preference of the young people, the way they want to learn today. And, and, and adding that, uh, you know, kind of combination of technology probably is the answer. Um, I don't think in a large scale it is rolled out, but we can see that happening already, particularly in societies where you have this kind of a flexible mode, uh, model of uh, training delivery is being uh, tested. Yeah, it's a great. You know, we spend so much time complaining about the way tech companies capture our attention, but maybe what we need to do is leverage the way they capture their, our attention in order to do things like training um, and, and go, wow, they've, they've learned how to do it in a way that maybe they're not doing it for the things we want them to do it for, but that doesn't mean we can't use it, the same, the same skills. I saw a hand up back here. Thank you. Uh, my name is Amos. I'm coming from the Republic of South Africa. I have a question for all panelists, but in particular uh, the Minister, Malis, and Mr. Reddy. And this is in relation to, you know, the, the, the engagement that we are getting here is in relation to the future uh, and uh, are those who will be preparing themselves for employment in the future. But then little do we hear about how do we protect the current jobs. The only thing that we hear from you is only upskilling uh, in terms of uh, the current jobs uh, and in, 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 not, in that, uh, not that vigorously so. But now, so the issue is, now in terms of the presentation that I've seen, 56% of adults do not have uh, um, understanding of IT or skills on ICT. So what will government do uh, together with business to make sure that whilst we are preparing for the future, we are also protecting current jobs? Because those who are currently working are those who must assist to pay for those who are preparing uh, for the future. I'll make an example. In South Africa, you have the banks that are going full stream digitalization. But then in the process, many jobs are lost without even replacing. Because capital make a lot of money through dig digitalization, whilst most of the jobs are lost. How will government and business work together, uh, Malias, assist uh, each other to make sure that they navigate the problems that we are going to confront currently whilst we are preparing for the future? Thank you. That's a, that's a, that's a great question. Malias, do you want to? Uh, well, shortly saying, I don't have any good news. Um, uh, it's uh, in, in a big picture, there's a lot of jobs which are lost forever uh, because just, for example, a factory is making itself more efficient. And let's say there used to be 200 people doing the same job and there is 15 left. Or in agriculture, 
in agricultural sector is one of the most, I, I think, the, one of the fastest changing. The, that used to be, let's say, um, uh, the normal uh, beef or cow farm, where it used to be, let's say, for uh, I just a simple example close to my home, there used to be, I think, something like 400 people working. Now it's 12 or, or 15 something. All the rest is made by the machine. It just they are so much more efficient. And I, I'm sorry, but I think these other 180 people are either have retired, fortunately, very often, or they basically have lost that kind of job. So the, the areas where it's made more efficient, um, robot, it, let's say semi-robots, it's not that, you know, when we talk about robots, then there is always this Hollywood movies okay. comes in the mind that you know human type of robots walk around and you know they do the same job. No, it, it's not. It's just that uh, they're half uh, automized, mm -hmm. and and it's just uh, it's very very many areas. Nothing really. Well, government cannot really say don't make it more efficient. So what do we do? Is is honestly only retraining upskilling, uh, giving possibilities to, to find the different areas. And uh, for example, there is also good examples to, to give a positive one. We have um, a lot of post offices have been replaced by uh, packaged uh, electronic uh, uh, fast and fun uh, uh, post offices where you can go 24 hours and, and you just type in a thing and you get your package. It gives you keep a certain temperature so you can send also cold stuff and so on. So it's, it's amazing but it's of course has replaced a lot of human. And what uh, now they're doing is that they're retraining actually postal workers who have uh, possibilities and, uh, and they are giving them actual new skills. And they're actually learning to take care of the machines. Mm -hmm. They talk to machines. And um, well, but I, I don't have 100% good news. Not everybody is willing to. Not everybody wants to. Not everybody can move with a job. And uh, so there are some jobs which are lost forever. But it, it comes with the new ones. And there are new possibilities. I, I also think it's important that you mentioned that the the, 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 a, sh a shift in the way we think about the narrative and that it's not actually jobs that are lost to, anima to, to automation, it's tasks that are lost to automation. And that often it's a restructuring of the, uh, of, of the business, of the organization, of the institution, of the jobs to think less. And just changing that changes your thinking. You're not actually replacing a person, so you may need to just teach them how they can use the skills they already have in new tasks. But there is also a positive thing with that. <laughs> so what is the positive thing is that um, exactly the tasks are replaced. But with every moment I think about how we um, add some value. Yeah. So even in agriculture, when let's say we used to create um, just, I don't know, the, the milk was the end product. So now because of the changing in, in, in a technology, and, and all the possibilities, you can actually create something even more with that. Or in a, in a I don't know, in a wood, uh, you can create actually more. So the more technology changing, more uh, we have research and fundamental knowledge with that as well, we can actually create new fabrics, new things. And also what we have not talked about is a climate change. So what the climate change gives us is a lot of power for the new research, new basic things, and new ideas, and also, of course, the IT sector, to create more efficient things, replacing carbon dioxide, and uh, replacing a lot of things. So this is also giving, not maybe today a new jobs, but tomorrow already. And then the people who today think lost, maybe in two or three years, they actually have found a new thing to do. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we probably have time for one more question. You, you want to respond to that? Okay, and then we'll fit in one more question. Uh, thanks for raising a very, very important real question, you know, that you are facing. Um, can we stop technologies um, into, um, you know, towards saving jobs? Is a, is a very critical question. Um, so how do we protect jobs that, uh, that people are uh, facing? Uh, this is a question addressed by the Global Commission on Future of Work. In fact, uh, co-chaired by your president, president of South Africa and prime minister of uh, Sweden, and eminent personalities from all over the world. And they, they handled these precise questions. And 
and came up with the conclusion that uh, for the future of work to be, deal, uh, to be dealt with, uh, we have to adopt people-centered approach, a human in command approach, even for any technology. And for the labor market players, uh, particularly in any country, it is very important that these policies are shaped by the governments, employers' organizations, and workers' organizations. These are the three key labor market players. And there, we, the, the Global Commission argued that the people-centered approach has to be adopted in such a way that we shape the future, not the machines dictate our future. Mm -hmm. And it has to be context-specific. And in that context, the Global Commission and also our Centenary Declaration called for investing in people capabilities is fundamental. And we want to create a world where people have jobs, not just, you know, machines are ruling the world. So we do not want to have a situation where there are, you know, all kinds of technologies, but people do not have the jobs. Is that the, job, is that the world we want? So it's very important to invest in people capabilities. And equally important is invest in decent work creation in our own societies. If there is no work, but, you know, all kinds of technologies can lead to a chaos, social chaos and invest in decent work institutions. And that, that one institution I would like to highlight is the social dialogue process, whereby any transition, in your own particular case, any transition of losing jobs, while it may not be really difficult, it may not be possible to stop a particular technology, but through a process of social dialogue by the employers and the workers, how can we enable the transition of these people from one job to another job? And it has to be a very constructive process, a participatory process, so that you minimize the risk of these people being left out. Okay. You know, they may be doing this job for several decades, and suddenly a new technology completely destroys them. We have to take into account of those people, what next? And there is a shared responsibility by the state, by the employers, and by the individuals. Thank you. So, again, a sort of narrative shift from not just how we prepare people for the future, but also how we prepare the future for people. So, yeah. Uh, one more question very quickly. Let's, yes. Yeah, okay. It's, I, it's here. We're, we're getting close on time, so I'll ask you to make it as, as, as it quick will. as you can. Thank it, you. It will. Thank you very much. My name is uh, Mushiri uh, from Kenya. Uh, so, I come from the TVET uh, industry training. And any time that there's a problem in demand and supply, uh, I think that's why we talk about of losing jobs and all that. So, my question goes to Reddy again. So. How do we bridge in the gap between the skills consumers and the skills providers in as far as uh, digital literacy or digital training is concerned? Uh, say, for example, the, 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 the skills consumers are the industries and the skills providers are uh, the institutions, the training institutions. What should they know in as far as digital literacy in, is concerned so that as they prepare this youth for the future or for the jobs, then the youth are very ready for what the skills consumers need. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very quickly, to reduce the skills mismatch, um, one of the very important things is to listen to the businesses and not only consult, but keep them in the leadership role in terms of what skills are needed for the businesses and bring the training and education providers closer to the businesses, as much close as we can bring, whereby it is not the educational and training institutions that will decide what skills and competencies that they will acquire or, or they will provide, but it is the businesses which will decide. I'm saying decide, not consultative. Because in a lot of developing contexts, we have this situation where training providers will deliver training because they know that is the best thing. This morning we heard because there is absolute lack of accountability on the part of the training providers. What happens next is not their business right now. There is no, neither expiry date nor accountability. But if we bring that accountability whereby a training provider will be, for example, just as a hypothetical case, will be only reimbursed by, if it is state funding, if those training is leading to jobs, make a direct link, then certain training programs will cease to exist. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, so no, I'm sorry. We're not going to have time for another question. Maybe you can ask, ask them on their, uh, on their way out. But I will ask each of you in the interest of closing, closing the session, if you can each, uh, we'll, just, we'll just go down the line. And if you had one question that, that, that everyone here should ask themselves in thinking about catching the digital skills wave, what is, what is it? You don't have to answer it. Just, you could just pose it, right? Um, so, that, so, that we leave, so we all leave thinking and, uh, 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 and asking questions. So, uh, I'm, I'm just now repeating myself to give them time to think about an answer, and now I'll go. <laughs> I think you have to understand uh, and think about in your life that you need to understand how, how strategy you use to learning something, because the only certainty that you have is that everything is changing very fast. My, my simple question is, how can we dream to ensure that lifelong learning becomes a universal entitlement to every person walking this earth. Um, how we can uh, teach uh, teachers to teach students to teach machines? Because um, I think uh, it will be a main question. Well, I'm sorry, but I'm very bad in asking questions. I normally like answering questions. <laughs> so, um, so if I if I start out of rhetoric, um, just two sentences, I would say the um, uh, the last question was a very good one. And I, uh, why I started to smile, I was thinking that actually the very very basic answer would be keep people the skills which I think OECD, UN, I mean all of the big good papers are actually saying what we need to educate people is of course of we continue teaching them languages and math and all of that. But the personal skills, team building, risk taking, possibilities to be open. Because funny enough, but the private sector, actually, if you have a good human capital there, teaches the people to do even coding very, very fast. But yeah. you need to have a basic knowledge and very good human skills. And this is actually, I don't know how to put it in a question form, sorry, <laughs> but I would say that's the thing. Sometimes we forget that this is where we start. And training digital things, coding, programming, doing all the cool things, comes on top of that, and it comes afterwards. Yeah. Well, thank you all, thank you. Let's give a big round of applause to our panelists. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Very engaging conversation.